Hi everyone, welcome to a new week. This week we are going to be talking about subsistence patterns and this is chapter 7 in both the online and the face-to-face -face textbook. Um, so chapter 7 for both courses. Um, as we move through, you might hear me use the term foodways um, instead of subsistence patterns. Foodways is just more broad and foodways really refers to um, our beliefs and thoughts and interactions with food of all sorts. So eating food, preparing food, growing food, just thinking about food, food symbolic nature, um, and things like that. So if you hear the term food waste, just know that is a broader term um, that we use to kind of encompass the entire section of anthropology that would deal with any interaction with food, where subsistence pattern is more specific to a type of food production. Okay. So to get started this week, I want to kind of start with an example about changing food ways in India. This example comes from the face-to-face -face textbook, but I really like it, so I use it in the online course as well. Okay, and so in India, for thousands of years, we have a focus on rural subsistence farming, um, which just means farming for your family and your immediate family. So not farming to sell, not farming to trade, just kind of farming and growing and producing what you need as a unit. Okay, this focused on mostly grains and vegetables. Okay, so a relatively healthy human diet, um, focusing on grains and vegetables. It was um, kind of diversified a little bit. And then in recent decades, we start to see the Indian government start to yield to pressures coming from outside sources and from industry. And so we're seeing a shift from this subsistence farming or farming for yourself to more of an industrialized agriculture. Okay, and so this is including um, heavier machinery, you're producing a lot more food, sometimes it's um, cash crops instead of food, even so you're not producing things to eat anymore. This also included um, the use of GMOs or genetically modified organisms and fertilizers and pesticides which were not being used before. When you're farming on a much smaller scale you don't tend to need the same level of technological input um, like GMOs or fertilizers and pesticides, um, you tend to need those things when you start to shift to a much larger agricultural system. So why would they do this? Well, it promises more profit and inclusion on the global market. So if you're only creating food for you and your family, um, you're not included in the global trade, global market of food. Okay, so if you're producing just um, grains and vegetables for yourself to eat, you're kind of isolated from that global market. And so if the government can kind of get um, individuals in the country to shift away from subsistence farming and more towards um, industrial agriculture, they can become involved in the larger global um, market and, and it kind of increases their standing on a global level. Part of this shift um, includes a shift to cash crops. So these are things like cotton and soy, um, that these are things we can't actually eat um, and instead you're producing them to sell and then theoretically you can use that money to purchase food um, instead of just growing your food. Ideally you would be able to have a surplus amount of money coming in from those cash crops to that would allow you to purchase food and then also purchase other things that you might need but it's a big shift in the like thought process and the way that people in the country are farming and thinking about farming and thinking about money. And so for this to work, you have to have outside foods or processed foods. Okay, you can't um, use this money or you have to use the money to buy outside foods. So if you're selling your cotton and you're selling your soy, now you have cash on hand, but to be able to eat, there has to be outside food or food that was produced elsewhere or processed food that you now have access to. Part of the issue is that access to this food this type of food is very unequal and we can see that in the US as well. Okay, So very rural areas don't have access to outside food or processed foods as much as people living in cities might have access to processed food or food produced elsewhere. Okay, And so switching to cash crops gives them money on hand and they can then buy whatever food they like but they first have to have access to that food. Okay, And so there are a lot of different impacts um, in India. So we've got some health impacts. This, like we said, caused a shift towards a reliance on outside foods. Um, once this happened, 63 million people acquired type 2 diabetes. 
Okay, and this is a disease of, um, we can call it a disease of the prosperous and overnourished. Okay, this comes from eating unhealthy foods and eating too many foods, too many fats, too many sugars, and things like that. Okay, so this is a disease of the prosperous. And then at the same time, 300 million people are undernourished. Okay, so 42% of kids in India were suffering or are suffering um, from malnutrition. And then this we can think about is a disease of the rural poor. So they're switching to these cash crops and 63 million people now have access to unhealthy processed outside foods that they can use um, and purchase with their money from the cash crops while 300 million people now have money to buy food but there's no food there to buy but they aren't growing any more food because now they're growing um, cotton for example to sell as a cash crop so you've got these two different ends of the spectrum from the same um, source from those cash crops you also see an economic impact um, what comes along with being included in the global market can be a reliance on the global market okay so to get started in cash crops it's expensive and so um, farmers would then instead of using the seeds they had saved up over generations um, from their vegetable and grain farming they would have to um, buy the cash crop seeds themselves and then special tools so in order to grow a huge field or a lot of cotton um, and to do it at this level you really need to have um, fertilizers and pesticides so then these farmers were forced to buy these things well, they didn't have that amount of money on hand because they weren't collecting a lot of money to begin with. So they had to take out loans to purchase these things. Okay, and then any shift in the global market disproportionately impacts small farmers. Okay, um, there's not as much of a safety net because you're constantly rebuying the seeds and the supplies and um, the fertilizers and pesticides each year. You're not um, a lot of times able to save those seeds. And so any shift in the global market that causes a downtrend um, or causes the seeds and supplies to increase in price is going to disproportionately impact small farmers. And so then they get in this cycle of debt. And so in order to pay the debt, now they have to farm even more cash crops, which requires purchasing more seeds, fertilizers, pesticides, and things like that. And so getting in this cycle of um, building debt and then being unable to repay that debt. There are also some ecological impacts and social impacts. So ecological impacts, um, we're focusing mostly here on a really big shift in land use change in a really short period of time. So the environment is really resilient. Um, it can bounce back from a lot that we as humans put it through, but when you have a lot of change happening very, very quickly due to technological advancements or the implementation of new technology, the environment has a much harder time bouncing back from that. So seeing a really big shift from subsistence farming to agriculture um, at this type of large scale involving pesticides and fertilizers, the environment doesn't bounce back quite as quickly. And then we're also seeing through those pesticides an overuse of them, um, and that's resulting in um, damaging the environment and waterways, soil, um, and animal and plant species, and then also seeing pesticide resistance within the crops they're producing, which is a cyclical cycle, so um, you end up with pesticide resistant crop from overuse of pesticides so now the bugs are getting back into your pest into your plants so you have to apply even more pesticide and then it becomes even more resistant and then you need a new pesticide and you have to pl apply a lot of that and then that becomes resistant and so it's a very um, circular process and it's kind of a downward spiral the social impact um, like we said with the economic there's a lot of debt being built up and it's very difficult to pay off that debt, but there's a very large stigma associated with debt and thus being unable to provide for your family. And so between 2006, or 2002 and 2006, um, we saw tens of thousands of farmer suicides because of this social pressure and this inadequacy they were starting to feel because of um, these debts that were building up. Okay, and that, um, increased 17,500 deaths by suicide per year between 2002 and 2006. Okay, So all of these changes seem unrelated maybe if you if I just told you about these changes independent of the um, preface of switching from one mode of subsistence to another you might think they weren't related 
but really they all stem from changing relationships with food and how we produce our food. Okay, and so these changes are happening all over the globe, and so we're starting to think about disease related to diet, environmental sustainability, social consequences, and all of these different aspects of our society that's actually very closely related to our food ways or our subsistence strategies and our relationships with food. And so this is what we can study as anthropologists, the big picture. We can put together the little bits and pieces of information we're going to learn about this week, and we can study them as how they relate to the culture at large and the health and happiness and well-being of the people in that culture.